some clarity. And at that point, it will be probably, um, it'll probably be a week um, or so that we will actually meet again. I say this because sadly, the first feast coming up, if you're able to see the screen share, uh, which is a feast of trumpets, known as a, as, a, as a feast of trumpets, or it's actually not a, technically it's not a feast, sorry, the day of trumpets. So that is a miss, that's a, that's typed incorrectly. So it's actually day of trumpets, it's not feast of trumpets. Out of the seven, of the seven holidays or so, seven high Sabbaths, three of them are feasts, the other one are um, high days. Uh, sorry, four of them are feasts and three are high days. Uh, the Day of Trumpets is one of them. So you have the Day of Trumpets, you have um, coming up, and typically, um, according to the scripture, we are to gather on every Shabbat, including the high Shabbats, which would be the, the what would be the, day, the appointed days of the Lord. Um, so we were going to meet here on Monday because it starts Monday at sundown uh, through Tuesday at sundown. That is the Shabbat for that day. So we were going to gather on, on Monday evening at 6.30. <clears throat> Sorry. And um, so given, given this, that is sort of cutting right in the middle of what we're going through, um, we may not gather in person. Just want to give you the heads up, Okay. We may, we may, we are going to still gather, Lord willing. We're still going to gather virtually, okay? But we're not going to gather in person. Now, for that day, we're going to do something. And this is the reason I'm communicating this. And I'll update you so that you're getting prepared. So what we were going to do is we're going to welcome the Sabbath together. So we're going to break the bread, share the wine, but do the kadush, everything together because we were meeting right before sundown, okay? Because obviously, um, uh, you know, because here in Florida times, we, we clocked it so that we have service and boom, we have the, the breaking of the bread and welcoming of the Shabbat in the middle of that. If we do it virtually, I'd like for us to do that still. So um, there's a couple of things that we're gonna need. And I'm gonna tell you what it is. So that way you just basically, um, Three simple things that we're going to do. I'm going to keep it simple. Here at home, we've been studying a little bit deeper. We're doing it. Um, uh, we're doing it a little bit different. We're we're doing a little bit traditional at home when we do it. And I was going to just do a show and tell on that day, just to show you and demonstrate what we do in our home. But I'm going to keep it simple for uh, when if we do it virtually, okay? Because you may not have all the elements that are required, okay? Uh, we have, we've been little by little acquiring our, you know, the elements needed and, um, but you may not have that. So, um, so what I'm going to do is that we're going to ask you to have ready um, three things. Okay. So the three things would be to have a candle. Okay. It could be any candle. It doesn't matter. Scented candle, hurricane candle, as long as it doesn't have a saint or any image on it. I say this because I know that hurricane candles sometimes do have that. Um, but any any candle, motif candle, even one of those little tea candles, does not a big deal. Just a candle. Because remember that in the in there's a couple of reasons that we 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 do these things every time we welcome the Shabbat. Um, and, and one of the things is to separate the holy space, that sacred space of sundown to sundown. And and it's and, and in the and then the custom that has been developed because of the temple's destruction, one of the customs developed has been to light up a candle as a sign, as a symbol that when, when I light this candle, everything is changing. Every, my atmosphere changes, the sacred space begins, and then basically that's what it's for. It's for you to mark a point, okay? So um, that's why I'm saying, you know, don't have to bend over backwards, just a simple candle will do, okay? Um, the, the second thing that you're going to have is either a small, okay, a small cup of wine or grape juice, okay, whichever. Uh, uh, we, we use kosher wine. Um, that's what we use here. We use kosher wine, which is, you're probably familiar with Munchwitz, I think it is. So that's what we use. But 
you know, it's up to you if you don't want to use um, wine, you can use grape juice. So just a small cup of grape juice, okay? And it doesn't have to be tiny, just a cup. There's something for you to drink. Uh, this is different than what we've accustomed ourselves in communion. I just want to give you a heads up. In a normal Sunday communion, on Sabbath, you welcome the, the cup of wine or the cup of grape juice is a representation of you now sitting in the table of the king and that we're sitting as as hosts with the king of the universe, okay? So that that sweetness and that idea of something that we don't do every day, right? Um, because we're not drinking every day, that, um, that's what that symbolizes. So we, we do that, we use that cup of wine. And then the bread. Now, um, the bread, we were at Whole Foods, uh, we ordered some food from Whole Foods and they had these little beautiful egg rolls and onion rolls and they're small, uh, delicious or like a dollar. If you go to Publix with Dixie, I'm sure that in their bread baskets, you can just grab a little roll like that. Um, we grab two small rolls because here at home, it's two of us. Um, so we grab two small rolls and that's what we use when we do the Shabbat presentation on our weekly Shabbat. Um, but you can bring one or you can have two if you want to. Because, and the reason that we have two, and I know this is kind of like a mini Shabbat presentation thing. So um, I'm going to teach this all over again. You're going to hear me redundantly about this. But the whole reason for the bread that we have too is because we're reminded of the double portion that God gave to his people in the wilderness. So that is that double portion. That's why we have two. Do we need two? We don't need two. But to tell the story on and on as a reminder, as a tradition, on the Sabbath table, you have two pieces of bread or two loaves of bread, okay? Um, does it have to be challah? Challah is a tradition that the Jews use. It could, as long as it's bread, you're fine, okay? So it could be a Kaiser roll. Um, it could be, you know, Puerto Rican bread, whatever. Just um, whatever it is, as long as you have two pieces of it. If you can't do two pieces, you have one. One is fine, okay? One is fine. Because we're not going to eat the whole thing, <laughs> which is the part where I'm getting to, we're just going to eat a piece of it. Um, and usually what we do at home is that that's, you know, we eat that for breakfast, the rest of the bread for breakfast the next day. That's what we do. Um, because again, it's part of that portion, that double portion that the Lord provides, right? Um, if we had more people, then we would share one loaf of bread and then the other one would be saved for tomorrow, or, you know, for the next day so that we have that double portion. And we're reminded even as we're eating breakfast, that the Lord had provided a double portion for the Sabbath. That's the reason. Um, but just have a piece of bread with you. So again, let me just recap. Candle, um, a cup of, you know, uh, grape juice or wine, um, and in a small roll of bread or piece of bread, slice of bread, whatever it is. We want to have those ready, those elements for the Shabbat service on Tuesday, um, sorry, Monday, September the 6th, okay? I just want to say this so that we plan ahead so that you can have your elements ahead and you can have them with you and uh, don't feel like, you know, you're lost when we're doing in the middle of the that service. If we're doing here something, I don't want you to miss it, okay? Um, and we're going to do the same thing for the other services, Lord willing, We'll be able to gather for Yom Kippur. That's that is the most important high day um, in the Scripture because it, that is the day of repentance, right? That's the, the most important day. So we pray that we get to meet on that day. Um, then, of course, we'll have Feast of Tabernacles and we'll have the Shemini Yatzeret, all those days. And I'm praying that we're in health because right now I got news: Brother Ray is not doing too well after his surgery uh, he's still having a little bit of the shakes and balance issues miss bernie broke her elbow the other day and she's a little bit out of commission um and so we got that going on i know that um uh, i know a amy has been uh, getting better from her covid but uh, her mom is in hospital with covid still um so you know, we we're having that issue. And then we have also Debbie and John, Debbie's parents uh, were in the hospital for COVID. They were dealing and getting tested for COVID as well and kind of working through it. 
it's everywhere. So we're going to be, we're going to work as we can roll with the punches, but continue to honor and praise the almighty, which is part of what we're going to do today, kind of have a conversation today here. So I just want to kind of leave that up there for you so you can have that um, and uh, have it at hand. If you don't know, or you forgot what were the days coming up for this, these are the what's known as the fall feast or the fall holidays that are in the scripture. Um, you'll see them when they fall and when we are going to gather for. This does not substitute our regular Sabbath meetings. Remember, Sabbath is Sabbath. So, so you have the weekly Sabbath and you have these, these special days that the Lord appointed. And the weekly Sabbath is one of those special those days that the Lord appointed. All right, so just uh, quickly so that... Um, for those of you that like to prepare, uh, give me one second here. All right. And yes, yeah, so we got next week's portion is Neat Savin. And um, it's going to be from Deuteronomy chapter 29 all the way through chapter 30. That is next week's portion. And remember, we like to give these to you for the purpose of for you to study them, right? To read them ahead of time so that when we meet, you're familiar because it's very difficult to go through the entire portion. I mean, to go in depth, especially when there's multiple subjects. Like in today's portion, there is multiple, multiple subjects. We're not going to be able to go over all of them, but we're going to go over main idea a very big principle in these um and, and and that i believe that we we may we must not forget okay um and as we continue to read these more and more often in the cycle every year we're going to be more familiar and understanding of certain ways certain customs and certain things um let me um i'm going to go ahead and uh, bring up today's portion so that we have that so this is today's portion so today's portion is from Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 1, to chapter 29, verse 9, or verse 8, depending on the version you have. Uh, we're not going to read all of it just for the sake of time as well and for us to be able to focus on what we will be doing. And I pray that you, if you have your Bibles, have them ready, because that I don't, for some reason, it's not coming up on my screen for me to share that scripture. So I don't know why. I don't know why it's coming, not coming up. Okay. Good thing that I got my scripture here, but you, will, you have your Bibles there. I'll have my Bible here and I'll read it out loud, the portion from the portion that we're going to read. Matter of fact, let me uh, just uh, have that ready for you. So we're we're going to read from verse, uh, we're sort of going to jump a little bit from between the chapters. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually read from the, um, from chapter 26, um, verse 16, then we're going to jump into 27, and then we're going to jump into 28. And our focus is going to be on chapter 28 um, and 29, so to speak. That's going to be really the biggest focus on, on what we're going to do. Uh, 27, 28, and 29 out of out of today's reading. But I'll lead you guys. So just have your, your Bibles ready as I lead you through that. And as we are accustomed to do, we're first going to say a prayer together as we honor the fact that we are reading from the words of the King, uh, that we are reading from the words of the Almighty. So we want to make sure that we give honor to who honor deserves. So if you would pray with me. Praise the one to whom our praise is due. Praise be the one to whom our praise is due now and forever. We praise you, eternal God, King of the universe. You've called us to your service by giving us your instruction, Torah. We praise you, God, giver of the Torah. Amen. So we're going to start off with chapter 26, verse, <clears throat> verse 16. This day, Yahweh, your Elohim, commands you to do these statutes and rules. 
You shall therefore be careful to do them with all your heart, with all your soul. You have declared today that Yahweh is your Elohim, and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes and his commandments and his rules and will obey his voice. Yahweh has declared today that you are a people for his treasured possession, as he has promised you that you are to keep all his commandments, that he will set you in, a, in praise and in fame and in honor high above all nations that he has made, and that you shall be a people holy to Yahweh your Elohim as he promised. Chapter 27, verse 1. Now Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, Keep the whole commandment that I command you today. And on the day you cross over the Jordan to the land that Yahweh your Elohim is giving you, you shall set up large stones and plash them with plaster. And you shall write on them all the words of this law when you cross over to enter the land that Yahweh Elohim is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as Yahweh the Elohim of your fathers has promised you. Now, jumping over to verse 9, the same chapter, verse 9. Then Moses and the Levitical priest said to all Israel, Keep silence and hear, O Israel. This day you have become the people of Yahweh, your Elohim. You shall therefore obey the voice of Yahweh, your Elohim, keeping his commandment and his statutes, which I command you today. And then we're going to jump down over to chapter 28, verse 1. And just remember that these verses that I'm highlighting are the ones that are the focal point of today's teaching. It does not mean that the, the, all these chapters are part of the, the, the portion, okay? But the, the ones that I'm reading are a lot of the ones we're going to focus on today. And if you faithfully obey the voice of Yahweh, your Elohim, this is 28.1, being careful to do all these commandments that I command you today, Yahweh, your Elohim, will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, if you obey the voice of Yahweh your Elohim. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, and the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds, and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall be you, you shall be when you come in, and blessed shall be when you go out. Jumping now. To verse 15 in the same chapter. But if you will not obey the voice of Yahweh, your Elohim, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Curse shall you be in the city, and curse shall you be in the field. Curse shall be your baskets and your kneading bowl. Curse shall be the fruits of your womb and the fruits of your ground, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Curse shall be when you shall be when you come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. Excuse me. Yahweh will send on your curses, confusion, frustration, in all that you undertake to do, until you are destroyed and perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds, because you have forsaken me. All right. Now from there, I'm going to go ahead and jump down all the way to... Chapter 29, verse 1. These are the words of the covenant that Yahweh commanded Moses to make with the people of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant that he had made with them at Horeb. And Moses summoned all Israel to them. You have seen all that Yahweh did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. The great trials that your eyes saw, signs and those great wonders. But to this day, Yahweh has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you and your sandals have not worn off your feet. You have not eaten bread and you have not drunk wine or strong drink. Then you may know that I am Yahweh, your Elohim. And when you came to this place, Shiloh, the king of the Hezbon, and the Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us in battle, but we defeated them. 
We took their land and gave it for inheritance to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of the Metasites. Therefore, keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all you do. <clears throat> may the Lord, O oh God, the one who is the voice of this word, bless us greatly, Lord, with this message, uh, with the teaching that you bring forth in these very words, even in the verses that we have not read. We thank you, God Almighty, for the instruction you've given us, and we pray that as your chosen, we diligently choose to follow them as you expect us to. By the merits of Yeshua and your mighty and holy name, Hashem, we say amen. Well, that was a uh, that was intense, wasn't it? I mean, um, let me get my screen sharing off here for a minute. Let me get back to you guys. Perfect. Okay. Um, it's definitely challenging uh, to read a portion like this in our lives, especially those of us that walk away um, or you know, are in the, what's known as the transitional process of, of, um, of walking away from the church environment that we were brought in um, or that we came from uh, on the Western mindset of church. And um, oh, give me a second here, I'm not sure why I am missing one of my screens here. So I'm going to give you, oh, okay, perfect. I know exactly where we are. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's hard to process. I mean, to be quite fair, I still read this chapter and I get, I get a little bit, you know, it kind of racks my understanding um, I have so many questions at times, and I have to go back and dig in to understand, you know, the heart of God into this and knowing that he has some expectations that I know that I have failed to follow. And, and, it's, and, it, and that he and his mercy has allowed me to go back and learn, understand, research, take what I did know and take the passion that I had to grow and to become a follower of the rabbi known as Jesus or Yeshua, however you want to call him, who is our Messiah. And that desire of becoming a disciple led me and my wife to open our eyes to a greater picture that was very countercultural to what we're used to. Um, you know, 30 years of indoctrination that I've had in my lifetime. Um, I, I could say that I always knew that there was this missing piece. And, and I now understand why I felt this way for so, so long. Um, and I'm glad that, that the Almighty was patient with me in allowing me to, to see these things. And, and when we look at, at a portion like today, uh, the portion that we see there today, um, it, it's very, very scary because what we, what we don't want to see in any way is, is, is for us not only to fall into the alignment of, of the curses, right, um, but those that we love and care for. We don't want them to be part of that at all. Um, today's... <sighs> I, I guess one of the things that I got to tell you that today's is a message is going to be known as a very repetitive, redundant messaging point. And that is not far from the norm when you look at studying the, the instruction or, or the word of God, because it's the same word, right? We just have to repetitively, re repetitively study it. It's part of that method of education and repetition, right? repetition as we as we continue to read it and study it and read it and study it and read it and study it some things begin to stick little by little we're not gonna we're not gonna figure it out on the first run but as we progress as we progress every year as we continue to study every portion and because every part of the scripture every part of the torah interconnects with it 
for example, Deuteronomy is sort of a summary of the previous four books. So, so even now, as we're studying Deuteronomy, he's repeating basically now he's going doing an overview over everything that just happened. Um, in the other books, we get to see a repetition of the beginning of when the commandments are given. The book of Numbers is about how, how do we establish this? How do we organize this? How do we put things where they belong based on the instructions that were given in Exodus, right? So this interweaving, cross-pollinating, repetitive style of writing in the Near Eastern mind is very common, especially with the limitations of not having accessible libraries, of course, not having technology like we have today. Um, you know, today, if you don't have a phone, you have a sticky, you have a sticky note or you have a notepad, right? So you don't have to use technology, but believe it or not, paper and pencil is a technology and it was not readily available to any, to everybody back then. Okay, it's hard to think of that, but it wasn't, right? Um, so it was, it's one of those things where, where the, this method of teaching of going over and going over and going over it's because God wanted us to never forget. And that is one of the threads used in the entire scripture is that to never forget, to always remember. Remember what? Remember the ways of the Lord. To remember what? Remember the commandments and the, and the, uh, and the ordinances. To remember the statutes, right? To never forget. Never forget what? Never forget the Sabbath, for example. Never forget his law, his commandments. Um, so even having them written in something that is going to be sort of more permanent, like in the example that we just read today, where he ordered them that before you know, when crossing the Jordan to, to make these two pillars, to actually um, cover them in cow, cow, you know, basically the, uh, to plaster them, and then to write on them the commandments is, is to leave a testament, right? A foundation, a marker, for others to see in time. Now, that would be like, you know, posting something in, you know, in the entrance of the city today or, or in a city hall, you know, putting a monument. It, that, that's what it was. And, and back then in that mindset, those were ways. Now it's interesting, God's the one who's ordaining it, right? God's the one who's ordaining it. So for the longest time, God is having to say, Write them in stone so that you don't forget. Write them in stone so you don't forget. Because one day, I want to have them written in your heart. Right? Which is the idea that the prophet speaks about having his law in our hearts, written in our hearts, is the idea that we will not require a reminder that's in front of us, fate looking at us as if it's accusing us, but that the commandments of God is in our desire. It's in our wanting to do it, that we desire to do it just because. I don't know if you ever felt moved or led to give someone a gift, something. And 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 the person is like, oh my goodness, what is this? It's not my birthday. It's not any special holiday. What is this? And you just have the pleasure of saying, it's just because, just because, just because I love you, just because I care for you just because you're special, just because I thought of it and I, I thought of you and I just wanted to give you a just because gift today. And it makes you feel good that because you realize that what you're giving has no agenda, has no agenda. This is not like I cannot go, go to that party without a gift. I cannot go to that wedding without a gift. I cannot go to that birthday without a gift. I can't go to my mom's house on Mother's Day without at least a flower, right? We, we, those are things that, that we are so used to, right, to do, but to know that we, we know to find that willingness to give something to somebody just because we can, just because we want to, it gives us a very big feeling of satisfaction, right? And, and in many ways, that is what the Lord wants us to have, is to have the satisfaction, the joy of following his commandments, doing what he wants us to do, being obedient unto him because we want to, not because we have to, because there is a desire, there is a, there is a calling in us, right? 
and, and there's a, there's a portion here that I read today, the one, um, the one that speaks about, you know, for the Lord has not given you um, eyes. Um, it's in uh, chapter 28, 29, sorry, chapter 29. So that verse in chapter 29 it says, but to this day, Yahweh has not given you heart to understand or eyes to hear. If you read the previous verses, what it's trying to say is that that God is not making anybody do anything or trying to force anybody to do anything, that they witnessed it on their own. In other words, they saw the miracles. They saw fire come from the sky. They saw the column of, uh, of, of the cloud covering them. They saw the locusts. They saw the frogs. They saw, they saw Egypt letting them go. They saw Egypt defeated in the water. You know, they saw the manna come from heaven. They saw... They saw all these things, and, and it was not because God made them see it in a way like, you know, only you could see this. No, they were witnesses to what was then a reality of a of a living miracle manifesting in front of them in their favor, right? Because God was protecting them. So, so what 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 he was trying to say is, I've shown you all this these things. You have seen them. Not because I'm the one who's putting them in your head, not because I'm the one making you or convincing you, but you're you're seeing it for yourself. So you have to decide. You have to decide for yourself with what you're seeing, with what you've heard, right? You 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 see the miracles of what where your clothes don't tatter and torn. You see the miracles of your shoes lasting forever. You see that that you you have been set apart. You have not eaten yet. I have provided. Right, you have not eaten certain things, but yet I have provided others that you cannot get. The idea that that God is trying to tell us, oh, listen, that we have the opportunity to observe and see the goodness of God, the greatness of God, and and for and for them to still ignore it. And folks, in in our anti previous anti Semitic mind. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about me. I'm not going to talk about you. In my previous anti-Semitic mind, being brought up in church, um, and I call it anti-Semitic because it is anti-Semitic. In my mind, I saw Israel as a group of idiots. I saw the people that were led out of Egypt as idiots who did not, who did not really um, take advantage of the fact that that they were able to literally see miracles of God manifest before their eyes, okay? And it's like, oh my goodness, how dumb can you be? How stupid can you be? How... And it was this mindset, right? It was like treating them as cave people. That's how I was seeing it. And um, and the more I've studied, and you know, and, and as my mind has transitioned away, from that indoctrination and to open the scriptures in a different light and to study history and understand a little bit of history, a little bit deeper about that. Um, it's not that it wasn't, it wasn't that they were, they were stupid. It wasn't that they were, they were just dumb or cave people. These people yeah, for the time that they were living, they were pretty advanced in their civilization, believe it or not. But I realized that they were human just like you and me no different than us that sometimes take things for granted little things right we we're no different than them in the way that we complain about our life our issues right the things that we place before god oh god please <laughs> Make my make this person do this. God, can you make this person do that? God, can you make this person do this over here for me? And everything is about making God do something to somebody to make them to do something that they're not going to do on their own. Therefore, it's never going to bear the fruits that God wants. You know, I I adjust to the way I pray for our kids, and I know, and they and they know it because I've communicated that with them. I says I've I've changed the way I pray for you, and this is the second time. That I've had that conversation with them because the first time I had the conversation individually with them was when they when they came to age. So when they were when they went from child to teenager, I had the conversation where I told them I changed the way I pray for you now. Now I pray 
that everything that you've learned as a child, as I covered and protected you in prayer, that now as a now that you have your choices to make to sin or not to sin, that you will remember. That you will remember. Because I can't pray for them to make the right choice. I have to pray for them to remember what is the right choice so that they can choose to make it. So I had that conversation back years ago. And I remember that Jonathan, his reaction was he freaked out. He started crying. He was crying when I told him that my prayer will no longer protect him. That your roses and my prayer was like, we, our prayers are not going to protect you. You're going to now have to pray on your own. You're going to have to now make sure that you're doing what's right. Because now you've come to a place that you've come from a place of innocence to knowledge. And when you come to a place of knowledge, now you know, understand, now you understand what sin is. You are accountable with your decision. So I remember that he was, because he had a grasp of what that meant. And the second conversation was within the last couple of months within the last couple of months where I was able to communicate to both of them and say, you know, individually again, you know, that my prayer for them has changed again, that as much as I've used to pray, Lord, um, let them see. Um, and when I would see like, Hey, Lord, please let them see your truth. It was really God, please force their eyes to look at your, what your reality is and make them change your mind. That was really my heart. Even though my words were saying, please let them see. And I was trying to be, my heart as a father was like, can you please get into their head and, you know, what I cannot do, God, please you do. So I had to have this conversation with both of them. And I, and I told them, basically, I said, um, my prayer has changed again. Now I pray that, that you are able, that you choose, that when you choose to open your eyes and to see the truth that's right in front of you, okay, that you will have a clear mind to make the right choice. Because I can't make you make the choice. And God is not going to force you to make the choice. Now, I hope, I don't pray, I hope that that happens before a tragedy, before a tragic situation in your life. I hope that, it, that you're not led to the truth of God through an accident. I mean, if that's what's going to lead you, that's what's going to lead you. But my heart's desire is that, is that you're led because you want more. That you're led to him because you desire him more. So that's what I would like. I would like, I would like for you to desire God more. And I know that my God is going to be there waiting for you with open arms when you return to him. And both of them understood. Both of them understood. Now, having said that, one of them is very active in their church. So, you know, the other one is on the fence right now. So, but both of them gave me the same response. And this was not as a result of them lacking or anything. It was just a result that I know that they are not, either of them, walking in the path in the way that God wants us to walk. Um, and, and when I look at a scripture like today, it worries me. It worries me as a parent. It worries me as a leader. It worries me as a pastor. Um, because I know that, that when we lost focus of what the scripture tells us, that there are curses that will follow us when we don't obey God. And not just not obey God, because, because I think that in most of our life, I mean, we remembering growing up, even in Catholic school, okay, and I remember that we were taught to obey God, right? And, and I, we thought we obeyed God by doing what we were doing. We thought we were right. We thought we were doing everything the way it should. Go to church, help people, you know, give an offering here, give out to missions, you know, be kind. All these things, we thought we were doing it right. Not realizing that there was much more that was expected of us, right? And it was right in front of me. This is not that I was reading, you know, the Scientology Bible all my life and I didn't know what scripture was, right? This is, I had still the same, all the New Testament. Yeah, a couple words here, maybe a couple of verses omitted or changed or mistranslated. But the main idea, the main idea, I could open, I could grab a Catholic Bible and still, and still see a lot of the things 
that are right in front of me, which tell me that God is expecting much more of us. Okay. And, and to realize that, that this is not just about obeying, but this is about obeying it his way. Talk about talk about taking away misinterpretation out of the equation, right? So this is not about how that person interprets obedience or that how that person interprets obedience or how I interpret obedience. No, this is God clearly saying, you're going to do things this way and you're going to do it this way because this is my way or you will be cursed. Pretty simple. And we, we do everything we can. Boy, do we work overtime to find the loopholes in the words of the Almighty. We do it all the time. We look for ways to figure it out, to, to find ways to circumvent, to turn around, to do these things. And it becomes this point where it's just not, it's, it's not it. You know, we went to, um, uh, we went to, our son's wedding, and I, I shared this with you last week, and our son changed his wedding time to an earlier time so that the wedding event would finish way before sundown so that we could be part of that. And so even in doing that, I remember that we arrived, or we arrived to where we were staying, and, and it was simple for us because we were staying about uh, 45 minutes away. So we arrived and we are, you know, getting the baby, baby ready and we're getting us ready for Shabbat and all this stuff. And, and even in, in, as I was sitting down, it was still unfamiliar because it was our first time doing a Shabbat like that. Um, it was like, you know, when there's a will, there's a way. It wasn't the same Shabbat that we do at home, but nevertheless, we kept Shabbat the way that God expects us to keep it. And, and I realized, I was like, wow, this is, it was a learning experience. Now, a couple of things that I did learn in my, that I now, I, I, you know, I took notes. So when on vacation or when on a trip, if I, if, if my Shabbat falls in that, this is what I will do. This is what I don't do. This is how I prepare for it because there's intention, right? There's the intention that in spite of me having a good time or, you know, in this case was going to see my son get married and spending time over there. In spite of that, you know, it was about, it was about this. And, and I remember that our son asked us a question. He says, hey, dad, so, you know, if, if any of the nieces or, you know, your nieces, like, you know, want to come over and see you and hang out with you and stuff, can you do that on Saturday? Was that, is that, and I told him, this is absolutely not. They are welcome to come. Just tell them to bring their own lunch. And, and if they want to bring their Bibles, because I'm going to be, I'll do a Bible study with them. You know, we'll talk about the Lord that we'll do, you know, but we're not going to, we're not going to go and, and talk about 20 other subjects. You know, I want to have a good time. I want to have family time, but tell them to bring a Bible just in case. Um, we'll talk about great things, what's going on in church, what's going on in life. I mean, I'm not trying to com convert them, but I'm also trying to navigate that this sacred space, this Shabbat thing that they don't understand, just because they don't understand doesn't make me now have to bend against the king, right? My king's still king, regardless of their understanding or not. So I still have to honor him because I'm aware. Now, um, I'm going to be very understanding. I'm going to be very gracious. But I said, hey, tell them just to bring a Bible because maybe we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some scripture. But yeah, we can hang out. We can chill. Tell them to bring their own lunch because we're not cooking anything. Um, you know, they can brown bag it, just hang out. And um, none of them came. Not a peep of anybody. It was like, you know, uh, it was strange. Um, because I thought that we were expecting people over and no, nobody did. Um, but we were ready. I mean, we were ready to stand firm into what we knew now. Um, you know, a lot of folks were, 
were asking if I was going to go see my mom on Saturday and all this other stuff. And I'm like, I already know. I was like, no, my mom, my mom is going to start cooking. I don't want to put my mom in a position to do, to break the Sabbath on my account. Um, and as much as I'll tell her not to do it, she's going to do it. And um, so I'm going to just stay put, just stay chill. Not, you know, we're not going to do really much of anything. So, you know, it takes a commitment. And my realization was to understand that even though in the eyes of the many around me, probably there has been criticism. I don't know. Maybe somebody said something. Maybe there was a comment made. Maybe when my son shared with my nieces, hey, you know, they're like, oh, that's weird. I'm not sure if I want to do that. Whatever it was, you know, whatever they felt and however they thought of me cannot compare to the fact that still I was willing to open the doors but I would not trade the day that the Lord called us to keep holy. It's our job to keep it holy. We don't make it holy. God already sanctified the Sabbath day. We're, the commandment is that we are to keep it that way, that we're to keep it holy. So we are the ones, it's our responsibility to put that marker so that in itself becomes that commandment that we don't bend, just like the other commandments, just like the commandment of adultery. There's no bending. There's no, well, I'm emotionally, you know, I'm in love with somebody else because I received no emotional love from my, from my spouse. That's adultery. You're, you're just excusing yourself. Well, no, I've never slept with that person. doesn't matter. <laughs> you're you're desiring something that is meant to come from your spouse, you're desiring it from somebody else and you're yearning for it as if it's yours to yearn and it's not. So you're meant to then either find counseling, you know, work it out with your spouse, but you can't be doing that because that's no different now than that, that just leads to the next steps from an emotional to a physical relationship. That's just common sense. So when, we, so when we're looking at the commandments of the of the Almighty, there's some commandments that you and I, by nature and by logic, we are not willing to bend, right? Right. I mean, that's the one that that's the one that gets me, you know, being disliked every time somebody asks me and says, "Well, no, the law changed," and I says, "So then, somebody could sleep with your wife, somebody could sleep with your husband. That shouldn't be a problem then, because we could do away with any." Who says? Who chooses what law is no longer valid? Who chose that? Who made that decision? God did not make that decision. The one who, the one who gave us the law did not make that decision, right? Oh, but we're part of the new covenant. No, no. We got to understand that this is not about a new covenant. There was never been a new covenant because if there's a new covenant, then where are the stipulations and who voided, who voided the old covenant? There is no authority that could void the covenant. Only the king could void the covenant. Now, I didn't know that. I didn't know that because I did not connect Near Eastern culture with, with the idea that Jesus had the authority to change anything. See, Jesus cannot do anything that the Father has not ordained him to do. And the Father in heaven cannot change anything that he's already ordained to be done. And we see that through the entire, uh, the rest of the Old Testament, when we see these examples of these Near Eastern kings that they cannot change the law that they did. They, they make a law and that law stays there forever. And, but the king cannot change it, even if he wants to change it. Remember the story of um, uh, Daniel and the lions. The king could not change the law when he realized he was tricked into making a law. And you would have thought, well, the king could have changed the law. No, he could not. He could not change the law. All he had to do is just sit there and wait. When, uh, when we talk about Esther, Queen Esther, and it is revealed that the king was tricked to create a law in order to, to commit, you know, to destroy all the Jewish people, all the Hebrews, when he realized that that law was there, he couldn't change it either, even though he knew he was tricked into creating that law. He couldn't change it because it was the law of the king. So that's why he modified the law. He modified the law. He added another clause to the law that was created that the Jews could, the Hebrews could defend themselves with no recourse. 
In other words, that they could that they could fight for their lives and they would not be um, it would not be criminalized because it would be considered self defense. So, so when we look at uh, the understanding of the mindset, right, of how this is written, and remember that the entire, this, this portion of the scripture, which is known as the word of God, the Torah, these first five books, I know that we know, we've we learned that the Bible as a whole is the word of God, but it's a, it, it, it's a very big generalization that makes us miss the idea that the foundation of the rest of the scripture is the first four or five books. The first five books is the foundation and everything is built on it. The prophets are built on it. Um, you know, the Psalms are built on it. The apostolic writings are built on it. Everything refers back. It refers back to these five books. So it's almost like everything that you see written from this, um, from the prophets, go back to Torah, go back to Torah, go back to Torah. So, so in essence, the, what is the word of God, the breath of God, is, is these five books, the Torah. So when we look at this as being the word of God and understanding that this is what his intentions are and this is what he is telling us to do, we, be, we begin to understand that God's commandments don't change. They don't. They are the same commandments because they are perpetual. There will be there be to follow and obey perpetually. Perpetually means forever, right? And so every time you hear the word new covenant, it actually is a renewed covenant. And there's an example of that renewal when you hear, when you read uh, chapter 29 of the book of Deuteronomy, there is a renewal of the covenant in the book in, in, in Moab. And you when you read the story, what does it sound like? Okay, what does it sound like? So so if you've been through the COVID crisis and you've been through a financial situation and you missed paying a bill, okay, you have a monthly bill for something and you missed paying a bill, you are delinquent, right? You're delinquent. You're falling off the contract or the agreement of what you're to pay. Covenants are contracts, okay? They're a treaty. All right. If you do this, I will do that. If you do this, I will do that. That's that's the treaty. The treaty is given by God. So it's a perfect treaty. It's not given by man. Okay. God says, if you do this, I will do that. Okay. That's the whole premise of the covenant. Okay. So going back to the example, if you fail to pay, okay, you have to make an arrangement so that you can get out of the delinquency and restore yourself back in good standing that term good standing right in your bill or in your with your account that restoration does it does it mean that you have a new a new contract a new account in most cases it doesn't in some cases i know that some companies do that they just start a new account for you very few of them are doing that for the most part, the common, the common practice is that once you reinstate yourself or you fulfill the agreement on how you're going to repay the delinquency, then your account goes into a status known as good standing, meaning that you have back, you're back on track to the original agreement, okay? You don't have a new agreement. You're back on track on the same agreement so the, the, the contract or the agreement was what? Was renewed. It was, made, it was made back to what it was originally made for. Okay? So it was back in good standing to what was expected it to be when it started. That's what that term renewed means. Okay? Doesn't mean that we change some things and remove some things so that, no. It means we're back in good standing. We just renewed it. Okay? You are in a renewal now. And so that is when we look at this, there are several instances where there are several renewals of the covenant. Okay? There's several renewals of the covenant throughout the entire story of the Old Testament. You get to see that because remember, there's some punishments that come down, right? Punishments that you read here 
in chapter 28 that you see happen later in the book of Isaiah, the book of Jeremiah, the book of Daniel, right? Uh, Lamentations. What do you read? Exile, pestilence, destruction, war, right? All these things happening. Why? Because they did not follow the commandments, okay? But then it was renewed every time. It was like, okay, we're going to start over again. You're going to pay the price. You're going to do this. But then once we, once you pay the price, once we, we take care of the, you know, all the things that you did not do and you return, you repent, we'll bring back the covenant again. So here's the covenant, good as new. Okay? And that's what we, that's what we see. And so in our lives, in our journey, you know, it, it's, a, it's a difficult um, thing to understand because we don't understand the mindset of the, of the Near Eastern. I'm going to share a screen or try to share a screen. Am I sharing a screen? It says I'm sharing a screen. Are you able to see a screen with things written on it or you see icons? Do you see icons? Say yes if all you see is icons on the screen with your head. No. Because um, I lost it. Can't see it. Maybe you can see it, but no, I can't. I can't see it. Oh, let me do something here. Oops. I'm going to have to do this again. Let me see here. Here it is. Oh, come on. Uh, let's do that. Okay. Give me a second. I'm going to actually stop the screen sharing. Loading window. Okay. Now we need to do screen sharing. So let me see if I can do the screen sharing. Okay. Okay. Now you can probably see my screen. Uh, I know the letters are a bit too small. I apologize for that. Let me see something quickly. If I could see if I could change. Oh, yes. Okay. Found it. So I think I can change it. Let me. Okay. That's a little bit better. Still, it's very condensed. So I apologize. This is so that, you know, this is one of the resources I use. This is the JPS tour commentary. Okay. Um, but it's interesting here when it talks about the structure of the discourse in chapter 28, um, how it's divided. So there's basically two main sections, as you see here, um, two main section blessings and promises and curses and threats. Um, so it's, it's interesting because it's coming out from the same voice of God, right? We, those of us that have been taught all this time that, well, God really does a curse. God used to curse, but he never cursed. You know, he really doesn't place curse on people. Well, here is something that will help clarify that God will do that. It's not his favorite thing, but God has already established that he will do these things, but these things will happen as a direct result of what the covenant establishes, right? So it's, if you obey, then here are the blessings and promises, right? But if you disobey, then here are the list of curses and threats. That's what we see in chapter 28, okay? And, and you'll see that it will, it will kind of skip back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And um, here, I want to point out this note here on the top now where it says scholars. So scholars once assumed that these problems were the results of interpolations by later writers who sought to make the chapter more vivid or incorporate allusions, some borrow from Jeremiah Lamentations. 
to the Babylonian defeat and exile of Judah. These writers were thought to have been careless about the way they disturbed the logical organization of the text. By removing the disturbing elements, scholars sought to reconstruct the original text of the chapter, which would be much better organized. Since sections B2 and B3 refer to siege and exile, they were partly and entirely eliminated as interpolations that updated the chapter of the defeat of the Babylonians. Some verses B1 were eliminated because of redundancy and disturbance of the order. With these omissions, section B would correspond more closely in length and contents with its counterpart, section A. So today, it's more understood about the literary style of the Bible, particularly about the types of literary style it follows, and more known about the genre of blessings and curses and its ancient Near Eastern background. Numerous examples of the genre have been found in Hittite, Mesopotamian, Aramaic treaties, legal texts, and other genres that display some of the features that have puzzled scholars in Deuteronomy chapter 28. In other words, the method in communicating the curses and the blessings are very common. This is an evidence that it's common, not just, so this was not something new to the mind of the Israelite, okay? To the mind of the Israelite, having a treaty, okay, having a covenant is, it was something known to them. It was, this is not like for the first time, they're like, covenant? What is a covenant? I don't know what a covenant is. No, they understood the concept of covenant. They understood the concept of, if you do this, I will do this. Okay, so that was a very common thread throughout the nations around that period. Okay, matter of fact, um, you know, uh, in the yeshiva that I study, we study the Code of Amurabi. The Code of Amurabi is a ancient Mesopotamian text that that almost becomes almost like their their Torah in a way, um, because it, it's written in a very, 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 very similar way when you read it. And uh, it's very similar to the way that it's written according to the Torah, which tells you that there is a root of humanity down to the creation point, right? So creation is rooted in um, to that moment where God breathed into Adam, into humanity. And from there out, every some people decided to do what they wanted to do. The very remnant decided to remain with God. And that was a remnant that God then worked with because everybody decided to do their own thing. But everybody at one point, knew what was right, knew what was wrong, knew how to do these things. So in societies back then, a treaty like the one that God established with Israel was not far, no, it was not a foreign thing. The difference was, the difference here was, is that this was a unilateral uh, treaty, meaning that that it was it was made to know as God was the sovereign king giving this treaty. So this was not a treaty between two big parties but this was god being sovereign being given to a people okay very similar to the types of treaties that would be provided by a conquering king okay but also also that everything everything within the treaty was going to work beneficial for for the people for humanity which is different from other treaties where there is a gain on the king, where the king would gain more land, the king would gain more, more tributes, the king would gain more whatever. In this case, the tributes and the offerings were already established as a given period, and they would not change no matter how far and wide Israel would expand. Does that make sense? In other words, it was not like, okay, the more you produce, then the more, then you will give me more of that, so to speak. No, what God specifically asked for sacrifices and for offerings, they would never change. It would remain the same in spite of how the land of Israel would expand. So when you're looking at the structure of the writing and you're looking at how things are being um, arranged within um, within the writing itself. And, and I know, folks, this is very technical. And the reason that I show this to you is because we're used to seeing, we're used to over-spiritualizing scripture. And I'm not saying that the scripture is not meant to be a spiritual document. That is just one of the main purposes of it, okay? Because there's much more than just spiritualizing everything. There is common sense. There is history, there is government, there is, uh, there is logic, okay, to serving God, all right, this is not just about this emotional moment, okay, there is clarity, 
And so when you look at when you look at these tools uh, that have used archaeology, have used anthropology, that you and I are not unaware of it, right? We are unaware of what it is to be a Middle Eastern citizen. Nevertheless, a Middle Eastern citizen living 3,000 years ago in a language that we have no idea how to speak or how to understand, okay? So, so there's a lot of things that you and I are foreign to when we're looking at how this document that we call the Bible, what it's trying to say to us, right? Because the Bible was, was written for us, but it was not written to us. And, and these are and these tools that we use to study helps us ground us to the logical part that God is sovereign, that God had some clear expectations. Okay, that God had purpose. Okay, and that God establishes in His in His in His perfection as a promise that He will bless those that obey His commandments, that follow the covenant, that keep the covenant, and that He would curse those that don't. When you when you begin to understand the the technical side of it, it just affirms what you and I already read, so to speak, if we want to say that, or what we already read together, it, it reaffirms it. That's what it does. It allows us to see, okay, so this is for real. This is not, this is not just me following God as a result of my mom told me or I went to school and learned it. Um, this is about having direct accountability taking ownership you know um we we we, we do this we, we 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 follow god because truthfully we wanted something out of it that was the or, or, origin right the origin of most of our steps into salvation was we don't want to go to hell <laughs> right so we wanted god to rescue us um we were sick, so we wanted God to heal us. We were broke, so we wanted God to provide for us. You know, uh, my marriage was in shambles. I wanted God to restore it. My kids were lost. I wanted them to be found. You know, I, it, was, it was a result of a tragic situation in our lives. Usually, it comes to that point where we say, okay, I want God. Because it's something that we want, not because, not because he is the king of the universe. Not because he is God. It's usually because we want something. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. If that's what leads us, I mean, look at Israel. Tragedy had to hit Israel in order for them to align themselves. Right? Tra they, that, there, there's something to be said. Okay, There's something to be said about people people missing out on something once it's taken away that, that there's something to be said about that that sometimes you don't learn to appreciate what you have until it's gone have you ever heard that yeah that we we, we enjoy the company of somebody or, but we never really really appreciate it and then when they're gone it was like oh my goodness i didn't realize how much i really miss that person you know typically something that we see that happening a lot is with this younger generation who don't appreciate their kid grandparents. I, I grew, I was still part of a generation that saw my grandparents as role models. And I praise God for that because I find validity in that. I find, I find validity in seeing that. Matter of fact, believe it or not, I've had the, I've had as a son, the, the brave or I don't know what you would call it, conversation with my parents and wanting them to be an example unto my children. I, I've had to have, not because my, my dad, my mom and my dad are, you know, my mom and my dad are human beings, they make their mistakes, but their, their priorities are very different. And even growing up, you know, raising my kids, they were distant. And so I, I called upon my, my parents several times uh, uh, with, with respect and I would you know share with them the importance of them 
be that role model like I had my grandparents. I would never say that my parents are not my parents, but my grandparents, they filled a very strong parental role in my life, a very strong influence in me. Uh, positive, God-fearing, respectfulness, accountability, you know, uh, these kind of things, you know, respecting my mom and my dad, all those things were, were key to them. My grandparents were not the grandparents that would that would try to overturn my parents' role. On the contrary, they would they would remind me, this is what my, your mom and dad want you to do. This is what your mom and dad expect you to do. So I didn't have those, I didn't have that other grandparent, the one that was hiding Skittles under my bed, you know, so that I would eat Skittles at night or do the, at least I never experienced that with them. Um, but I experienced what was hard work. I experienced what was to work with my hands and find to find honor to be able to do something, even if it was working in a farm in the back, you know, not having a title, not having recognition, but yet having people love you and care for you and seek advice from you. That was my grandfather. And so um, I learned that in, in this generation, you don't get to see that a lot. And one thing that you get to see a lot of younger kids is that when grandma and grandpa die at the funeral, they're all crying, they're all weepy, they're all like, oh, didn't appreciate them but then the next day they're just back to normal and living life uh, i grieved my grandparents death for, for a bit it was hard it was very very difficult for me because it was it was it was a challenge not knowing that they're no longer there um, and um and it became very you know it was very difficult but but that sense of of having to appreciate more and, and i think that i never had a chance thinking about it now i don't think i ever have a chance had a chance to say formally i thank you which led me by the way led me to actually call my uncles and my aunts one day i actually did that as an adult when my grandparents passed away and i called them each one of them and i thanked them because they're also very influential in my life and I called each one of them and I, and I communicated to them how important they were. And I thanked them for being there for me. And I thanked them for, for loving me and loving, you know, and, and, and being there when I was younger and all this. And it was very emotional, of course, you know, and, uh, but it was powerful. I wanted to at least in life, tell them how I felt about them and tell them that I was grateful that even though I may not, you know, be around as much as before, because, there's a whole ocean between here and Puerto Rico, <laughs> uh, but but that at least you know um, I want them to know that I do think about them, that I do appreciate what they've done, um, and and sometimes we don't have a chance to do that. Sometimes we miss on that, and it leads us to appreciate more, right? To appreciate more those things. I all that to say is that it, with God it's a very similar thing, and God gets it. He understands it. Part of the idea of, of, of laying out these curses is not because God just, we would want to hate us. It's because they're meant to lead us to say, okay, I'm very uncomfortable right now. Um, I, I better get back to where I was. What did I need to do? Let me repent. Let me turn my life around. Let me, let me teshuva, right? That's the Hebrew word for return and repent. Let me return to God and repent because because I'm suffering these consequences and I want something better. And I know that in my life with him is much better. Now, earlier I talked about agenda, right? We come to God because we have an agenda. And, but I did at the same time, I said, but if that's what gets you to that place and now you realize, okay, I was much better here. And now you begin to follow him the right way. And you allow the commandments, his commandments, to be written in your heart rather than stone. See, what happens is that because it's on stone, we tend to avoid it. We don't look at it. It's like a little kid who avoids having eye contact with a parental authority when they know that they want to do something without permission. Or they don't want to know that, that the other parent is giving them a look, you know, of the, what are you doing? It's an avoidance that we have, right? Let me overlook the commandment today. Let me overlook this law today because, you know, we don't, and, and we, we have that tendency to do this whenever we feel like it. Um, 
Whereas what God is doing, he's, he's saying, you know, I need your eyes on me. And what better way than chastisement, punishment, curse, whatever you want to call it, than to draw the attention back onto the eyes of the Almighty, meaning I want you to be back with me doing what I ask you to do. And so it becomes this opportunity. So even the interpretation, when we look at um, the writings of the ancient rabbis, it's an interpretation. Rashi actually says that it's a way where God is just allowing us to reconsider the idea that, that without God, things are much more terrible than what they were before. Maybe I felt constricted or maybe I wanted to do things in a different way. But when I decided to disobey him, then things went really bad and they went, went much worse. And I'd be like, uh-uh, uh, this is not good. Let me go back to this, which is, which is in many ways part of the premise of the story of the prodigal son, where he just wanted to do things his way rather than waiting for the law of inheritance and doing it the right way. Right, and he realized that it was not all that great, and we had done. He, 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 you know, had to come back. He had to teshuva, right? And so, so when we look at these curses and blessings, it's a clear picture for you and for me uh, that we actually look at the opportunity to to say that sometimes we do need to be put on the right track. God does not curse us because God is there, you know, trying to be mean. We, we use this consuming fire concept, which is not far from the truth, but we, we use it wrong. You know, he doesn't curse us so that he can destroy us. He curses us so that we could turn back. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 47, I think it is 47, because you would not serve the Lord your God in joy and gladness over the abundance of everything. Right? So because when you have so many things and you're overwhelmed with abundance, you get to forget God, okay? Because, because this is the thing that we forget to serve with joy while still experiencing great abundance. We forget because we find our joy in the pleasures of having these things. And so... So we tend to only appreciate the things that we lose. And that's when we're called to then take ownership. And that is that part of that curse versus consequence, right? Accountability, taking ownership to what, we, to what we're supposed to do, to what we're meant to do, to what God is calling us to do. Yes, to understand all the commandments of the Almighty takes a lifetime to learn. I'm learning them. I'm really doing my best to figure these things out. For me, it's a process of deprogramming, reprogramming, and learning in a deeper way what's going on. And in that, it's difficult. And I love to study. I love to read. Okay. And I, I'm letting you know, it's difficult. But on the basics, we should be able to be faithful to God. And what I've learned is this. I've learned, I've learned this in my journey, okay, but not, you know, my journey has taught me that this time last year, I was not doing Sabbath the same way that I'm doing it this year. So every weekly Sabbath around this same time period a year ago was different. Why was it different? Because I learned in the year later, I learned more things about what it is to, set, to keep the Sabbath and to honor this whole this sacred space with God that I did not know last year. So every year, every year, every cycle, every week, every month, uh, you know, we if our heart's intention is to have the commandments of God written in our heart and not on a stone, where I could ignore every once in a while or overlook, but I want to have it here in my heart so that I could want to obey it, then I will learn to do it the way that God is asking me to do it, and not the way that I think God would be okay for me to do it. Because that is what we've lived our life, for the most part, is 
you know, I don't think that God has a problem with me doing this. I don't think that, you know, this is an issue with God. I don't think it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't. Well, wait a minute. Let's look at the scripture. What does the scripture say about this? Because this is about what God thinks, not about what you think. Right? This is about what, this is about what he states, not about what I feel. So that part is the part that we need to move away from. The part of going from this, uh, I believe that God knows my heart, to I know that God knows my heart and it's filthy, it's dark, it's rebellious, it, it, it's distracted, it wants to do 20 other things out there and, and it wants to be self-righteous. Yes, God knows my heart. <laughs> because we use this God knows my heart thing to put a bandage on a on a on a dam that's about to break because we are we are trying to create a god image or commandments that are not aligned with the almighty and so this is this is a process ah, when you read this when you study this i, I got to tell you this the first time i did it i remember i was i was teaching it in the chapel and it was hard it was it was difficult even to read those things. And I was like, wow, you know, and I tell you that still today it is. But I could tell you that what I've learned up to now, it's not as challenging as I was before, not because of familiarity, not because I'm familiar with it, but because I understand it. I'm understanding more and more about the purpose of my king, that the purpose of my king is for all people to be drawn to him. He wants, he wants people to come to him, but he will not force people to come to him. So in spite of the curses, there's people out there right now, maybe people that you and I know that are living a cursed life. Okay. And a curse can be manifested in many ways. I know people who have money, who are rich, who go on vacation six times a year. Okay. Who are Instagram model so to speak because they model their family making it look like they're perfect and they are broken inside they are broken sad have nothing and i know people who are living paycheck to paycheck, to paycheck and are living the fullest life so when you look at blessings and curses be very observant okay be very observant in how we live today because, because in the generations that have passed, what was called a blessing has been becoming a curse for many because now we have owned it. Remember that back then, this was a theocratical system. Theocratical meaning that everything was centered in God. Okay, The government or the governing, governing system was expected to be centered in God. It was not a democracy. You and I live in a democratic mindset okay everybody has a right to say something everybody has a right to believe in something everybody has a right to do something i have the right to make it or break it or do whatever i want to do it's it's a concept that now it's i centered not god centered okay so everything everything including capitalism okay to a certain point commercialism all these things are centered in who i me okay as a consumer so now consuming is not a blessing. Having is not a blessing. Now, for many, having is actually part of the curse because you're trying to fill a gap with something because now this the life that you and I live here is not God-centered. It's different. So, so when you translate these curses and these blessings today, be careful to not make a direct transposition, okay? Because it could be, it's going to be very different. But nevertheless, it's about curses and blessings, right? It is. So, so be very cautious as you're looking at it. The bottom line is this. The bottom line is that God wants us with him. Can you believe that? He wants his creation to go back to him. But he's not 
going to force it. He's going to bless those that are walking in his commandments. He's going to bless them. He has promises for them. Those that choose to reject him, there's going to be a series of curses that are intended for them to step out of it. Layman terms. You understand what I'm trying to say? So that they can snap out of their rebellion and look back and say, oh, um, I think I need to go back. Now, will that happen with all of them? Of course not. Some of them are very stiff-necked. <laughs> Some of them are hard-headed. Some of them will still believe in what they believe. You know a few of them. Point being is that even in that circumstance, God is not going to turn their head. He's not going to change their ears. He's not going to change their hearts. God does not change hearts. Okay? That is a misconception that we, we've learned. That God does not change hearts. That's, we got that from songs. We got that from, from hymns, okay? It's not scriptural. The only portion of the Bible that talks about a change of heart is when we talk about the commandments. That instead of being the commandments given in stone, they shall be written in your heart. The other prophet says, and I will change your heart of stone, where the commandments are written, to a heart of what? Flesh living heart where everything now flows there the commandments are part of you that is the only reference of god changing a heart right but it's as a result of us making the choice so what god will do he will allow for people to snap out of their situation go back look and say this is better, or say, I still believe in what I believe and move in the opposite direction. That is the God that we serve, a God that is merciful, a God of justice, a God that is not a tyrant that's going to make things people think his way, because God is not making anybody think his way. He does not, and this is a statement that's very hard to swallow, God does not want anybody that does not want him. He will receive you once you come to him, yes. But if you don't want him, God's going to say, okay, deal with the curses, and hopefully that's going to help you realize what you're doing. But God is God. God is sovereign. God is still remains in his throne, and we are meant to serve him as his, as his subjects. That is our role, to demonstrate and proclaim unto the world the coming of the king, with acts of righteousness, with acts of justice, with acts of kindness, with acts of mercy that are coming from him as you and I are learning the Torah. Are we supposed to curse people? Nope. Are we supposed to tell people that they're going to be cursed? Absolutely not. This, God already told, you, told us that. It's in the scripture. So no, we're not supposed to curse people. Are we supposed to bless people? Of course we are. We can bless people in the name of God, in the name of the Almighty, as long as the blessing will follow the, the, the scripture, meaning that I cannot bless someone who is walking on a path of curse. So when I bless people, this is what I say, so that I find myself not lying or confusing people. And you'll see that in some of my writings. May the Lord bless you according to his commandments. May the Lord bless you according to his precepts. May the Lord bless you according to his statutes and commandments. You will see me now saying that. Why? Because if I have in my home, if, or, or if, I have, if, if I'm outside praying with somebody, or if I'm in a church, and I don't know the sin that's in their heart, and they are walking in sin, and they continue to walk in sin, they're not in repentance, and yet I'm going to pray a blessing over them? I have no idea. So when I pray, I pray, listen, I pray that God, that you will bless him according to your commandments, that if he's faithful to you or she's faithful to you, that you will be faithful to them. And do you believe that I lost friends as a result of that? Because not, they understand now, because they've gone back to the scripture and they realize this whole concept of the scripture. 
that God will bless only as if you follow his commandments. And I lost friends because of that. Because I've said, you know, and they'll ask me, well, why do you say that? Well, um, have you ever read Deuteronomy chapter 27, 28, 29? No. Well, take a read of it and just see what it says. Never heard from them again. Text them, call them, and never respond back. Why? Because it's obvious. It's right there in front of them. I don't have to tell them that they are going to be cursed or they're going to be blessed. And how? God already established that. So I can just leave them there. They can see it for themselves and then allow themselves to be convicted for it. But our job, your job and my job is to realize that the God that we serve is not a hateful God. He's a God that wants us to return. And even in the curses that he has, the purpose of the curse is not for God to prove himself. He does not need to prove himself to anybody. No, he does not. He is God. He created all things. But the purpose of the curse, the purpose of the punishment is for that people to realize there's no better place than me with God. Let me go back. Let me go back again. Let me go there and see and taste and find joy again and allow myself to renew this relationship with him and start over with him again. The covenants don't change. The expectations don't change. God remains the same forever. Amen. Folks, I kept you longer than I expected today. Um, I hope that um, that you found this portion today useful. I have. I've, uh, I've reviewed it several times. Um, I have multiple resources that I use um, for these studies. Um, uh, one good one that I get to share with you. Give me a second. If you ever, if you ever um, are interested to learn a little bit further about Old Testament and studies, is called a survey of the Old Testament. Um, this is a academic. Oops, I can't. I know you can't see it. Let me see here. Actually, um, wait, I'm going to change this because I don't know why. Can't, oh, it's the. Oh, okay, I know what it is. It's the background thing. I have uh, the shadow background, even though I have a background that's black. I mean, not, not black. There you go. It's white. I think now you should be able to see it. So there you go. Survey of the Old Testament by Andrew Hill and John Walton. It's a very big book. It's intimidating, but it's it's really um, it's written in an academic way. What I say by that is is that um, it's gonna show you facts and evidence, okay? So this is not a spiritual book. This is a academic book. Why do I study with this? Because again, I want to understand how, what was in the mind of the people when they were hearing this, when they were hearing what, what God was speaking from the mountain, when they were seeing things happen in front of them, the protocols, the ways, all these things. I want, I, I'm not, I'm not Mesopotamian. I'm not a Hittite. I'm not Egyptian. I'm not Hebrew. I, you know, culture that back then, 3000 years ago is slightly, you know, I have some understanding, but not as in depth to understand some of these things. So there's some really good resources out there, folks, that you guys could just dive in, read, study for yourself and check the evidence. And that's with what I leave you today. I pray that you are blessed. And if you have any questions for me, um, we will do our best to answer with what we can. I'm going to go ahead and open the microphones and the cameras. So that if anybody has any questions, we could, um, I don't know where the switch is, but I'm going to try this one more time and see. Okay, I think, I think we got it. Okay, let me move this thing here. And all right, we got it. All right, so any questions for today? We want to just make sure to see if we can help answer any of it.